and this is the, maybe the most important for getting us set up for fat loss for, for everybody really, but females especially, is doing a body recomp phase, doing a primer phase, doing a prep phase, a pre-diet maintenance phase, whatever you want to call it, spending about four to eight weeks before fat loss on a few key behaviors and routines or habits or systems, whatever you want to call them. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another solo episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. In our last episode, 126, more carbs, more muscle, why low carb and keto are keeping you skinny fat. I discussed all the reasons a moderate to high carb diet is essential if your goal is to build muscle, get stronger, improve your body composition, get leaner, and make fat loss easier. Today, as promised for episode 127, fat five fat loss mistakes women need to avoid, what to do instead, we will go over why females in particular should think twice before jumping right into a fat loss phase, the five most common fat loss mistakes women make, and how to set yourself up for a successful, healthy, and sustainable fat loss phase. Now, two thirds of my clients are female. Most of them are over 35, putting them squarely in the peri and postmenopause phases where hormones become an even more sensitive factor during fat loss, though they do not have to be a deal breaker. And I wanted to create this episode to focus specifically on aspects like low energy availability, carbs, and even the discomfort of change that come up most frequently with my female clients and listeners. Last thing before I jump in. I did create a new and totally free guide called Female Fat Loss, now available at the link in my show notes or at witsandweights.com slash free. It's a nicely organized summary of all the topics discussed on today's show as a reminder of what's most important, what mistakes to avoid, and how to approach successful fat loss. Again, just click the link in my show notes or go to witsandweights.com slash free to download the Female Fat Loss Guide. With that, let's get into today's topic, five fat loss mistakes women need to avoid and what to do instead. Losing body fat. <laughs> it's often seen as an aesthetic goal, but we have to understand that for women especially, there are additional considerations here regarding your health, your hormones, your performance, that need to be factored in. I'm all for going after the physique that you want, the dream body, whatever it is. And at the end of the day, we all want to have a healthy level of body fat. We want to look and feel our best, but we do have to understand the, the unique considerations that come into play. Now, every individual is different regardless, but there are some differences between men and women. I wanted to focus exclusively on women today. So approaching fat loss with realistic expectations and a plan an appropriate plan is really the key here. And before I dive into these, I do want to give a shout out and give credit where it's due. I want to give a shout out to Jeremiah Bear of the Living Lean podcast for inspiring this topic because he had Brandon DeCruz on, who by the way, was on this show twice before. And they did a female fat loss series. It was something like six or seven episodes, very detailed if you want to go check those out. And I definitely borrowed generously from some of the key points as well as my own experience and working with female clients, but I wanted to give a shout out to them. I'll include a link to Jeremiah's podcast in this episode and I'll go ahead and tag him so he knows, uh, give him the shout out. All right, let's start by talking about how fat loss, especially when done aggressively, affects women in particular and why you should avoid just jumping into a fat loss phase before you're ready. We want to be ready for fat loss so it's not just another crash diet. So there's really three big things here that I want to talk about. The first is that females, you know, women are more susceptible to the negative effects of low energy availability and calorie restriction. This is probably the biggest one. Many women are walking around for years and years and years in a state of low energy availability. I just talked to a client this morning on her check-in, a longer term client who she told me, you know, after she was done with her fat loss phase and she went back to maintenance, I was asking her to eat a little bit more than that, 
like not just exactly at maintenance, but a little bit more because I felt like her body needed to recover and wasn't getting the opportunity to do that. And she's like, well, I really want to maintain my results. I don't want to gain too much weight. I'm just going to kind of stick around maintenance for a while. And I said, okay, you can do that, but just, just understand that I think you'll get better performance and quicker recovery if you just kind of pop above that threshold for a bit. And recently she did that. <laughs> and lo and behold, everything just started to improve right? Her performance, her hormones, her, even her menstrual cycle, her sleep, stress, just the psychology of it, everything. And you may be walking around in a state of low energy availability, not even knowing it, thinking that, okay, because I've maintained my body weight, I'm eating what I need. No, it could be that your body is simply in that purgatory, in that no man's land in between, you know, full energy availability and a diet where you're losing weight where actually what's happening is you are in a very, 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 very slight deficit. And so it doesn't even look like you're losing weight. And every time you get a pop on the scale because of a little extra carbs, you freak out, right? Tell me this doesn't sound like a familiar story. <laughs> so being in that state of low energy availability is going to cause a perpetual disruption to your hormones. It can cause issues with your cycle. It can decrease your bone mineral density. Everything gets downregulated because your body says, well, you're giving me 90% of what I need, but not 100%. So guess what? I'm going to dock everything by 10%, and I might dock certain things more than others. And you have a higher risk the deeper you go of what they call red S, right, which is relative energy deficiency syndrome. In all honesty, that tends to be in the more extreme cases when you're severely in a deficit. I'm just talking about being in an unintentional deficit constantly. That's the big thing. So if you are in that state, if you feel like things are not right, things are foggy, maybe it's my hormones, maybe it's because of my age, whatever reason you tell yourself, and you're doing a lot of other things right, like your strength training, for example, and keeping the stress moderate, it could simply be that you're not eating enough. Right? I know it's a simple thing, and you've probably heard people say, well, you need to reverse diet, you need to eat more food. I'm not a fan of reverse dieting. I'm a fan of knowing exactly where your metabolism stands and then eating just slightly above that level so that you have all the energy you need and you feel great and you perform great, but you don't really gain any weight. And if you do gain weight, it's gonna be the most infinitesimal amount of weight over many, 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 many months, which is easy to cut off in a very short period of time with a fat loss phase. Okay, so that's the first one is understanding that you may be in low energy availability and that females are even more susceptible to this because of your hormonal situation relative to, to men. The second thing is training fasted, all right? A lot of you are training fasted. I'm going to suggest that you try training with some food in your stomach <laughs> and seeing what the difference is. I'm not going to say, oh, it's better. I'm going to say, let, let you decide that for yourself. But training fasted does a number of things. It increases your cortisol. Believe it or not, it increases your cortisol, okay? It increases muscle breakdown. It can impair your workout performance and recovery. You definitely have the risk of other hormonal issues down the road if you train fasted for a long time. And training intensely while fasted seems to exacerbate these effects. So before you even go to a fat loss phase, I would want you to evaluate how you train, when you train, and the timing of your food. Sometimes when people ask me about meal timing, they're looking to optimize and I'll tell them, you know, that's not as important as getting enough protein and getting enough food. But in other cases, if you're, for example, training fasted and you literally are just not eating around your workout, that can have a much bigger effect. Like even if you are getting enough food and protein the rest of the day, the training fasted piece, especially for females, can be detrimental and backfire before you've even gone into a fat loss phase. So I want you to strongly consider that it might be more beneficial to have a banana and a protein shake an hour before you work out, right? It doesn't have to be anything huge. It can be a bowl of oatmeal, right? Mainly protein and carbs and little to no fat and you're good. And the third thing that I wanted to mention here with regards to why women would avoid aggressive fat loss or going into a fat loss phase before you're ready is, and this is maybe the most important for getting us set up for fat loss for, for everybody, really, but females especially, is doing a body recomp phase, doing a primer phase, doing a prep phase, a pre-diet maintenance phase, whatever you want to call it, spending about four to eight weeks before fat loss on a few key behaviors and routines or habits or systems, whatever you want to call them. And they include the following. Number one, 
building some muscle. Now, this could be building muscle in a body recomp phase, or this could be spending a longer period of time actually building muscle, even in a surplus, but best case or worst case, doing it at uh, maintenance calories in what we call a recomp. And for those of you interested, we are doing the, let me see, when does this episode come out? It might already be happening, but we're doing our body recomp challenge in December. But regardless, that, that's just like a kickstart uh, for three weeks. A real recomp phase should take anywhere from like four to eight weeks, sometimes longer. And that's definitely the phase that I take my clients through first before we do a fat loss phase. You're trying to address the metabolic issues, the hormonal issues, the, the lack of fuel, the things like fasted training. You want to make sure you're lifting heavy, that you're lifting the, the right number of days per week for you and not doing too much, not doing too much cardio, making sure you're getting enough steps, making sure you're hydrated, making sure you're getting enough protein. It's all of those things, right? And I don't mean to overwhelm you by saying like, you've got to fix 20 things all at once. What I'm trying to suggest here is taking that four to eight weeks to slowly add in one to three of these tiny habits a week so that by the end of the four to eight weeks, you're in a great state for fat loss rather than jumping right in day one. No, I got to lose a fat. What do I do? Oh, calorie deficit. Let's do it. And then all these things are way off where they need to be. The fat loss phase is not going to be successful. And it's just going to be another crash diet. It's just going to be another yo-yo diet. All right. There's things like improving your relationship with food. Thinking of food as a fuel that serves you, that aligns with your goals, that, that, that helps your performance. Eating for satiety. Like all of, all of these skills that we've developed in a body recomp or pre-fat loss phase are extremely important to address before we go into fat loss. Okay, so I just wanted to lay all that out first, just so you know that this is a long game, that we wanna take this the right way, we wanna do it sustainably. And if you work with me as a coach, or if you're in one of my challenges, or even in the Wits and Weights Facebook community, you'll see these themes come up time again, time and again, and we can help you get to that point. We can put in place some of those foundational habits. All right, so now I wanna cover the five big nutrition mistakes that most women make so you can avoid these when you are setting up your fat loss phase. Now, we all love odd numbers. We like fives. We like lists. Could I have done seven? Could I have done three? Could I have done 10? Of course. But I, I spent some time on this, and I think these five come up the most often or could be the most helpful, all right? So, you know, beyond what we just talked about, like not taking this overly aggressive approach and just jumping in, what are the common pitfalls that women run into? All right. The first one is really about behavior, psychology. It's getting stuck in old habits and being unwilling to change and accept the discomfort that is inevitable when you're going after a transformation like this. Yes, this is the long game. Yes, this is your life. But you also have been stuck for years doing something that hasn't worked. And even when it quote unquote worked in the short term, like you lost a bunch of weight, you gained it back, didn't you? And when you lost the weight, did you have the physique and the health that you wanted? I'm pretty sure the answer is no. You probably lost muscle, right? Doing it the right way is going to get you the results, but it requires a little bit of discomfort. And so I actually talked recently on the podcast about getting, about pushing your comfort zone into the expanded comfort zone and being willing to change, but you don't have to change so much that it feels overwhelming, right? None of these diets that you've done in the past work. They don't work for a reason. They don't work because... They're not sustainable. They're not flexible. They don't work with you and your lifestyle. Wouldn't you rather live in the identity of a person who enjoys her life and enjoys what you eat and never feels guilty about it, right? And so accepting that change is inevitable, but also realizing that the cost of that change is far less. In fact, it's a basement bargain compared to the cost of not changing and continuing to do what you've always done. So for some reason, especially there's a difference I see between men and women when it comes to this kind of thing. And I, you know, not sure what it is, and I'm not going to dissect that because every individual is different even within that spectrum. But I think this is maybe the number one pitfall is just not being willing to accept change. Now, if you're working with a coach, like if you work with me, you've already shown that you are open to that kind of change and are willing to listen and and experiment. I've seen many people who don't work with a coach or they're looking for a quick out or the answer, right? They'll send me a question like, what do I do for this? I just want the answer. 
And then even if I give them <laughs> a suggestion or an answer, it's like, well, I don't want to do this because this, this, this. And there's always excuses, right? If you are making excuses, step back and ask yourself whether it's an excuse or just a reason not to change. Okay, two different things. All right, so that's the first one. All right, I told you, tough love today. A little bit of tough love because we all we all want to hear this sometimes, and we know what it takes, and it's it's not that hard. It just takes a little bit of um, a little bit of change and discomfort. All right, number two, the second big pitfall or mistake is the yo-yo dieting, which is yo-yo dieting on the large scale, weekend dieting on the short scale. And either way, it's a form of a yo-yo. It's an up and down pattern. And this up and down pattern results in what I mentioned earlier of low energy availability. So it's this metabolic whiplash where you think that when you're on the downside of it, right, when you're quote unquote in the diet, the dial's turned on, I'm going all after, I'm using my discipline and willpower. You think that, okay, now I'm going to be losing the fat or the weight or whatever. And it might happen in the short term and then you gain it back and then it happens in the short term and gain it back and then you hit a plateau and you constantly feel like you're dieting and yet you get nowhere and things get worse and your body composition gets worse and you get weaker and the hormones get worse and the sleep gets worse and the sleep gets worse. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? And so on the short scale, what might be happening is very simple. You may be Monday through Friday sticking to that diet. Saturday, off the rails. Uh, and I'm using terms that are kind of the standard conventional terms. And when you are taking the right approach to fat loss and you're taking a sustainable approach, no longer are you going to have, you know, sticking to it, uh, staying on track, getting off track, off the wagon, none of that, because it's not so rigid. But what you've done before is rigid. And so Monday through Friday, you're like a machine, you're rigid, you're perfect, quote unquote. And then Saturday, yeah, I'm not going to track today. I'm going to go out with my friends. I'm going to have just everything, right? the alcohol, the appetizers, the desserts. And before you know it, you've overconsumed by 2000 calories, but because you're not tracking, you don't know what your metabolism is. You don't even know what your exact, you know, weekly calories need to be to get where you want to go. You're not in touch with their hunger signals because you eat like a monk during the week and then you eat like a queen or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. What the, I was trying to think of like kind of a gluttonous. I was thinking of a king really, but then I thought, okay, this is about women. So what's the analogy? But you get what I'm trying to say. So that happens on a weekly basis. And then on a monthly or yearly basis, you're doing these like strict diets for three months. And then you're just ravenous for carbs and sugar and fats and you overconsume and you binge and you get it all back. And before long, you weigh more than you did before and more of it is fat than muscle. And the irony, I guess it's ironic, is that you have been in a low energy state the vast majority of that time. And yet it still hasn't gotten you anywhere because the net energy balance has not been favorable, but the majority of the days you've been suffering in this low energy state, right? Does that make sense? So when you're hearing this, you're like, oh, you are speaking to me. Like I'm constantly feeling like I'm dieting and I'm not making progress. It's because you're not actually in a consistent energy deficit for fat loss. You're probably not doing a lot of the other things too, but that's okay. We'll talk about that. And you're offsetting those, any progress you do have with the yo-yo aspect of it. So we're gonna stop doing that, but that's number two. Number three, cutting calories too aggressively. Very simple. Most of these diets, whether it's keto, carnivore, whatever, even Weight Watchers, doesn't matter, or the really bad ones like Octavia, Optavia, yeah, rely on the simple energy balance equation, right? Calories in, calories out. And yeah, you're gonna lose weight if you just starve yourself. <laughs> But you're going to get a lot worse than that. You're going to lose a bunch of muscle. You're going to dramatically slow down your metabolism. You're going to ramp up your cortisol and get super stressed. You're going to shoot down your performance in the gym. And you're not even going to be able to build and hit your lifts. You're not going to even feel like going to the gym, right? And you're going to do what's called a crash diet. You're going to lose muscle. You're going to get hungry. You're going to binge it all back. Same idea. It's kind of tied in with the yo-yo dieting. And so this is why we want to understand our calorie intake. We want to understand our metabolism and we want to understand how much weight we are losing every week, like body fat and body weight wise, so that we can stay within a reasonable rate of loss, which you may have heard me say it before, but I'll just reiterate is 1% of your body weight per week. That's the maximum you would want to lose. And most of these crash diets, you'll lose 40 pounds in a month. 
which just do the math and ba- based on whatever you weighed before, that's probably like three or 4% of your body weight a week. It's insane. You're losing so much muscle doing that. Actually, a lot of what you're losing initially is just fluid, but then you're losing a bunch of muscle. It's not what we want. Okay, mistake number four, avoiding or restricting carbs. Yes, you know I was gonna say this. The earlier things we talked about related to just restriction overall and you know not being willing to change, cutting calories too aggressively, and I'm not even gonna mention protein as one of the five, believe it or not. Believe it or not, I'm not. Because for some reason that ends up being something a lot of women get find out pretty quickly that they need to do and then they start to increase it if they are focused on it. We're talking about carbs, okay? And I talked all about this on the last episode, so I'm not going to rehash everything. But by eating too few carbs, you are impairing your performance. You are impairing your muscle growth. Yes, carbs are needed for muscle growth, not just protein, for a lot of reasons that I talked about in the last episode. Carbs are protein sparing in so many amazing ways. Not having enough carbs means you're going to disrupt your hormones. You know, increasing your carbs, I've seen time and again, have improved hormone production. Testosterone, for example, reducing cortisol, helping with your insulin sensitivity. Believe it or not, okay, sounds counterintuitive. You increase carbs, you get more insulin, you combine that with strength training, better utilizing the insulin, you're more insulin sensitive and now easier to lose fat because you have more carbs. And now if that's not the opposite of what so many influencers are saying, tell me I'm wrong, right? That's, that's exactly the opposite of what a lot of these influencers say where they say carbs will make you fat. Carbs provide fuel, they help with recovery, they support muscle growth, muscle building, optimize hormones, all the things. So that's mistake number four is just not having enough carbs. All of these have an asterisk behind them and that is if it's right for you. But what I'm sharing here are the pitfalls that affect the vast majority of women who are having trouble with this. And I will never say you have to do this or have to do that. What I'm suggesting is that many women are restricting carbs unnecessarily and having more carbs would help them with all these things. And once they introduce the carbs, voila, a lot of these problems go away. Okay, mistake number five is neglecting nutrient density. So we talk about flexible dieting, we talk about diets or good and bad foods and these restrictive diets. And it's always about, the foods themselves. The thing is, you can eat any food if it serves your goals. The question is, will it, especially for fat loss, also serve your health, serve your satiety, serve your digestion, serve your performance? Like Once you add all the list of things where we want to improve with what we eat, we realize it's not about specific foods, it's about the density of those foods, the nutrient density of those foods which ends up being primarily whole foods, but not a restrictive list of whole foods. All whole foods, (laughs) meats, you know, eggs, seafood, dairy, all the plants, grains, starches, right? Fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, all of it is okay, right? Unless you have an intolerance or something like that or just don't like it, it's all okay. And, And having a diverse food matrix, a diverse diet will improve your uh, chance of not having micronutrient deficiencies and improving all these other things, hormone production, thyroid function, metabolism, digestion, and the list goes on and on and on, right? So instead of like cutting out carbs and now all of a sudden you're eating just meat and you're missing out on all these other nutrients and dense foods that will fill you up and so on, have a diverse diet. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that and some of the details when we talk about specifics for fat loss at the end, or actually shortly. (laughs) But what I wanted to do here was establish, you know, when it is appropriate for women to consider fat loss and then the mistakes women make so you can look for those as you are going through this process. Now I wanna lay out exactly how to execute a successful fat loss phase, the moment you've all been waiting for. (laughs) And remember, you don't have to write all this down because I created a free guide called Female Fat Loss that covers everything in today's show. Just click the link in my show notes for the free female fat loss guide or go to witsandweights.com slash free. Okay, women, you are looking to drop fat in a healthy, sustainable way. What do you need to do? So I have a decent list here of things. And again, so that you're not overwhelmed, you may just want to go download the free guide where I summarize all of this stuff kind of in Cliff's Notes style. And you can re-listen to the episode along with it, make notes, all that good stuff. At the end of the day, what's important is that 
you take action, whatever that action is. I would take one action today based on this podcast episode that is based on how you were inspired by the show and what you're not doing that you want to do. Okay, first, <laughs> so this is gonna sound, what is this gonna, this is gonna sound counterintuitive or a cop out. The first thing to do for a successful fat loss phase is don't do a fat loss phase. Build muscle first. <laughs> That's the first thing. I'm not even talking about the prep phase. I'm talking about the opposite of a fat loss phase, going into a very slight surplus, a lean gain phase, where you just pack on your first, you know, 10, 15 pounds of muscle over the next six to 12 months. Having more muscle is going to boost your metabolic rate. You're going to be lifting heavy. You're going to be building that strength, building that muscle, improving your hormones, improving your insulin sensitivity, all these things. It's going to basically shift everything toward a metabolically healthier state so that when you do fat loss, it's even easier. Yeah, you're delaying the fat loss, but you're going to thank me for it. You're going to be thankful that you went through that process of building muscle first. So that's the first thing. But now I'm going to get it. The rest of these are, okay, fine. I got it, Philip. I need to build muscle. But I really, damn, I just really want to build uh, lose fat right now. Okay. <laughs> so again, assuming you've done all the other things we talked about and are not making the mistakes, what should you be doing? First, we have protein. All right. Protein. You know what? Hold on. I got to look at my list here because the... One thing I wanted to add to the list, I actually don't, I actually didn't have in my notes, which is kind of silly, is, is strength training. And that's primarily because today I wanted to focus on the nutrition side. But even if you aren't going to build muscle first, you need to be training as if you're building muscle before you do a fat loss phase. And this can happen in the body recomp phase. So training for progressive overload, lifting heavy and all that. I recently did an episode on progressive overload. Look, isn't this so nice? Every one of these topics, I've got like a full episode that goes into details on it. And you can always reach out to me on IG at Wits and Weights and say, hey, what was the episode about this? What was the episode about that? Do you have a video training on this? And I will send it to you. Okay, so training. But assuming you're doing that, the next thing is prioritize protein intake. Can't say it enough. In fat loss, protein becomes even more important than when you're not in fat loss, because this is going to help you preserve and repair and regrow your lean tissue, your muscle mass. This is how you hold on to it so that your body will be really stingy with the protein and instead it's going to go to the next source of energy, which is fat. Okay? It's going to go to fat. If you don't have enough protein, then it's going to your body is going to break down that muscle protein tissue because you also don't have very many carbs coming in. Let's be honest, the calories are low and you are going to lose muscle. We don't want to do that. So what's the target? I would shoot for the full one gram per pound of body weight, which is like 2.2 kilograms, uh, grams per kilogram, or even a little higher, like 1.1. Give yourself a little bit of a stretch goal. 1.1 grams per pound, which is about 2.4 uh, grams per kilogram. And how do you do that? Okay, that's the big challenge. You want to consume high protein foods. So eggs, yes, are kind of in that category, but you got to be careful for the with the fat in the yolk. So I would supplement whole eggs with egg whites during a fat loss phase. Chicken is always a good option. Turkey, fish, low to moderate fat or even no fat dairy are all good options. And of course, you can supplement with protein powder if needed. And most people do need to. Like the amount of protein you're going to want to get usually requires at least one protein shake for most people just to kind of get through the day with, with everything intact. And then distribute it evenly throughout the day is the best advice I have in terms of how to fit it in. A lot of people say, well, I'm too full or I can't fit it in or you know, I, I can get my calories but I never get my protein. Plan ahead, look at your day. How can you get three feedings, maybe two feedings, three feedings, four feedings, depending on what it is, and just divide, just subdivide the protein. If you need 120 grams, and you eat four times, that's 30 grams per meal. Now, one meal might have 50, and one might have 20, and one might have 15 or, or 35, but just distribute it throughout the day so you can, you can get it. Okay, prioritize protein. The next item is ensure adequate carb intake. Okay, so again, we're just focusing on macros right now, just to start simple. The thing in fat loss is your calories are low, right? So, and your protein is high. And your fat needs to be at some certain minimum level. We talked all about the benefits of carbs for muscle in the last episode. But I also suggested that it gets really 
difficult or gets to be more of a trade-off during fat loss because you only have so many calories to play with. Carbs are anti-catabolic. They prevent the breakdown of muscle protein. They provide fuel for high-intensity exercise. So my suggestion is after the protein needs are met, let's say it's 1.1 grams per pound, you can experiment with different fat and carb levels, mainly to ensure you have enough carbs. But some women respond better to higher carbs versus fats and vice versa. And I've had female clients who the carbs are pretty low, the fats are pretty low. We increase the carbs, not much difference. We increase the fats and all of a sudden they, they started to perform better. So you, you just never know until you try it yourself. But I wouldn't just pick a fixed number and go with it as a one size fits all. I would experiment with different levels. So for women, the fat can come down to as low as like 15, even 10 grams. I mean, 10 is getting sporty. I think Eric Trexler mentioned seven is like the rock bottom, but I would give yourself a little buffer and say 15 and all the rest go to carbs, anything that's not already reserved to protein and give it a shot, right? Now, part of it for a lot of women, it's the timing of the carbs. And here's what I see. For example, let's say you train in the morning. First of all, <laughs> don't train fasted or at least experiment with training fed to see how it feels. So that that's one problem is training fasted. But let's say you're not training fasted and you are eating, you know, three meals a day and you train. If you are not shifting those carbs toward your workout, you may experience a performance degradation. And so time the most carbs around your workout. If you work out in the morning, get like 60% of your carbs or even 80% of your carbs around the workout. If you work out around dinner or you know in the evening, same thing. If you work out in the middle of the day, same thing. Shift your carbs so that they are parity workout. Parity meaning in the vicinity of your workout. So that's the second thing. Especially important for women, especially because you're going to have lower calories to play with than most men. I'm sorry to say, it's just, just reality, right? You're smaller, your metabolisms are lower, you know, you have less muscle mass, etc. That's one of the differences. Okay, next is the, well, nutrient timing around the workouts, I think I already covered, but the last one was carbs specifically. Then I wanted to talk about nutrient timing specifically around training, both carbs and protein. So in addition to shifting most of your carbs to around your workout, also make sure to have protein before and after. And by before, I mean two hours, you know, before or less, it doesn't have to be half an hour before. And after, I mean like within an hour or two, have protein. So again, you're kind of shifting a lot of your calories, your really important calories to the workout period to maximize the muscle preservation and the use of that training signal. Okay. The next thing for successful fat loss is eating high nutrient density foods. So the very simple approach here is the 80-20 or even in fat loss might be 90-10 approach where 90% of your foods are whole foods, the other 10% is indulgences, whatever you want, right? And so it's a little tighter during fat loss than if you weren't in fat loss. So you're going to focus on whole foods, lean protein, fruits, veggies, dairy, whatever, whole foods that fill you up, that have a lot of nutrients. So I have a preference or a bias toward more green veggies, more salads, more steamed vegetables, roasted vegetables with your dinner, like putting vegetables wherever you can, as well as fruits that are lower in calories like strawberries. A huge bowl of strawberries can really fill up your stomach at the cost of like 100 calories. You know, very few calories, but it fills up your stomach. But don't discount other things, like even in your indulgences. If you like popcorn... I mean, you can eat a huge bowl of just lightly salted popcorn, air popped popcorn, and that's very few calories compared to like a tiny bowl of, you know, chips, which are which are cooked in, in fat, right? They're going to have a lot more calories. Again, I'm never saying anything's good and bad. What I'm saying is during fat loss, nutrient dense foods are going to be your friend because they are going to have more fiber. They're going to fill you up. They're going to take up more space, Okay. Uh, and they ensure that your diet includes some, at least the minimums of certain things, of certain nutrients like magnesium, zinc, iron, chromium, all those things. Which leads me to <laughs> the next item, to address micronutrient deficiencies, which become way more common during fat loss because you simply can't consume as much food. So even if you are focused on nutrient density foods, you just may not have enough mass of it coming in to give you optimal levels of all the different vitamins, you know, vitamin D, iron, zinc, and so on. And this is where you could use blood work. 
Like if you want to take this to the next level and be totally sure, get blood work done, you know, before the fat loss phase and then maybe halfway through and kind of, and even at the end, and you can see what you are susceptible to in terms of deficiencies correlated with the calorie deficit, right? Not just in general, because everybody has certain deficiencies because they eat a certain way or genetics or whatever. And this is where you would use supplementation strategically. So the common supplements I recommend for most people and most of my clients are going to be a multivitamin of some kind, magnesium for most people, vitamin D for some people, fish oil for some people. It depends on if you're deficient and really need these. If you get a lot of sunlight, you may not need vitamin D. If you eat a lot of fatty fish, you may not need fish oil. But in a fat loss phase, you might be eating super lean fish or white fish and not getting very much of the omega-3s, right? So in fat loss, it becomes even more important that you are addressing your micronutrients where you can. Okay, and the reason I say that is because these minerals and these vitamins cascade into lots of performance-related aspects of your life. How you feel, how you sleep, your stress, on and on and on. And it could be the simple remedy you need to, for example, get a better night's sleep. Like you may be deficient in magnesium, you may be getting migraines, you may be whatever, and it could be a nutrient deficiency, and this is more common in women because you're eating fewer calories than men, all right? Next is improving your relationship with food. Now, I, I'm not just gonna say, do it. <laughs> like, okay, improve your relationship with food, go, is more complicated than that, but it doesn't have to be. So the big rule, I hate to call it a rule because we're talking about getting away from rules and rigidity, but if I had a rule, it'd be don't view foods as good and bad is what it comes down to. Eat foods because they satisfy you, because they are important in your lifestyle for who you are, what your schedule is, what you do, what you like, your preferences, your social calendar, the things you do with friends and family. Plan in the indulgences because we don't want to binge eat. We don't want to emotionally eat. We want to be able to have the things we enjoy occasionally by choice. And then part of that is learning your hunger and satiety cues, you know, physical versus emotional hunger. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you here, but the overall picture here is we want to be consistent and be able to adhere to our diet during fat loss and not feel like we are suffering, like we're miserable, like we can't eat things. Instead, I want you to take one or two indulgences that you enjoy and plan them in. Plan them into Saturday. Plan them in every day if you if you want to, right? Like if every single day you want to have a cookie, this, this awesome cookie that you like and it satisfies the sweet tooth and one cookie will do it or two cookies or whatever, plan it in. Look at the macros, calories, plan it in and work the rest of your diet around it. As far as hunger, you are going to have higher hunger during fat loss. And so this is why going back to nutrient dense foods, high fiber foods, high volume foods is going to make a big difference. If you can drink a lot more water and eat a lot more veggies and eat more strawberries and watermelon and whatever, and things that fill you up, in addition to the things you need for protein, because protein is also satisfying and filling, then you've got it covered. You can still fit in, okay, okay, white potato. White potatoes are the highest satiety food because they are resistant starch. A lot of people don't realize that, right? They're more, way more satisfying than sweet potatoes. People think of sweet potato as this amazing nutrient food, dense food, and potato, you know, white potato is this bland, inferior cousin over here. Not true. White potato has a ton of nutrition, and it's extremely filling. So slice it up, put some seasoning on it, and cook it, you know, roast it in the oven, and have that with your dinner, right? Okay, <laughs> so being consistent rather than perfect, eating for satisfaction, planning and indulgences, not viewing foods as good and bad, all of that stuff related to your relationship with food. If you are not there yet before you start a fat loss phase, it's just gonna get worse during fat loss. This is why the body recomp or the prep phase is important because at least there we can say, okay, all these things are in place. I know how to eat like my 80-20. I know how to plan things in. I know how to do meal prep. I don't eat with guilt. I know that I can enjoy my indulgences. I understand when I'm physically hungry versus emotionally hungry, all that. And this is where working with a coach, I know I, I say this a lot and it sounds like I'm plugging my service, but I got into this because I saw these problems and I had them myself. And when you can help somebody and guide them through and take the stress off in this area, a lot of the other stuff just gets easy. So it's very important. And especially for women. I just see this way more with women than with men for whatever reason, okay? And it's probably the pressures you put on yourselves, the pressure society puts on you. It's the body image. It's the dieting. It's the this, 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 okay? Okay, the next thing, hormones. We want to make sure hormone production is optimized 
as best we can with the natural approaches. And by natural, I mean your lifestyle. Yes, supplementation to an extent or even herbal supplementation in some cases. And then some form of hormone therapy or treatment if needed. Now, if you've got a dysregulation or an imbalance in your hormones, whether it's thyroid or testosterone, DHEA, whatever, right, your perimenopause, menopause, whatever, and you haven't addressed that, I would not want to be, I would not want to have you do a fat loss phase until you do. So I'm going to make the assumption that you've gotten blood work, you've gotten urine metabolite testing or saliva testing, you're working with maybe a hormone specialist, you've gotten your uh, free testosterone checked through blood work, you've got your progesterone, estrogen, estradiol, all that stuff checked, and you've taken steps during the body recomp or the pre-fat loss phase to improve your training, your stress, your sleep, all that stuff naturally to get it to the best level possible. And then if you need replacement therapy, you're getting that as well before you do a fat loss phase. I know not everyone can do that. I, I realize that it's sometimes a longer process, but just know that during fat loss, if you hit plateaus or if your body isn't responding or your metabolism drops like a rock, it could be related to some hormone imbalances that are not lifestyle derived. You know, your ovaries produce testosterone well, your ovaries produce less and less until they produce zero testosterone at some point. And if your stress is through the roof, that also affects your testosterone. Well, guess what? Testosterone is a huge player in all of this. I'll actually be covering that in it's one of my first episodes in January with Karen Martell. We talk about that. But anyway, my point here is hormones for women are extremely critical. You know, I don't, you don't need me to tell you that. Natural ways to improve it are going to be, the big one is reducing stress and getting better sleep quality and quantity. If you're getting five hours of sleep, if you're running around constantly with a busy schedule with no time for yourself whatsoever, that is gonna make fat loss a lot harder. And the reason is, is those hormonal imbalances lead to a downregulation in your metabolism. That, that's really what it comes down to. You're simply going to burn fewer calories, and that means you can't eat as much. And then if you can't eat as much, you might be in low energy availability, and guess what happens? It all gets worse, and it's a vicious cycle. So reducing stress by improving your adrenal function, improving your sleep quality and quantity, okay? And I have a lot of resources in past episodes where I talk about some of this stuff, so reach out if you need specifics. Make sure you have normal menstrual function. Make sure that you've gotten things checked as needed like thyroid and cortisol, your reproductive hormones, testosterone, estradiol, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, all of that. And if you need to be taking therapy under a guidance of, of a specialist or doctor, go for it. One more thing is uh, adaptogens. I'm a big fan sometimes of, of certain adaptogens like ashwagandha. I just found out about uh, something called Gorilla Mind Sigma as well for women to potentially boost your testosterone. Now, again, these are all herbal supplements. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not dispensing advice. I'm just saying that those options are out there. And if you want to experiment with them, go for it. Okay, so <laughs> this is really important during fat loss because if you don't have your hormones optimized, you are just shooting yourself in the foot by downregulating your metabolism by potentially hundreds of calories. And not only that, it could be to such an extent that as you cut calories, your body just further downregulates to catch up and you just stay in a plateau. And that's why we want to address these issues first. Okay, almost done here. A second to last item here is setting up and running your fat loss phase with proper tracking. Okay, so now we're talking about the nuts and bolts of the actual fat loss phase. Here's where I'm going to suggest using Macrofactor to log your food. I don't like any other food apps on the market, food logging apps. They all suck. This is the only one that I think works really well because it is adherence neutral. It doesn't punish you, doesn't give you flash ups, you know, red numbers because you were over or under on your calories. It simply says, hey, here are your targets, here are your minimums, here are your targets based on how many calories you're burning this week. And then next week, here are your new targets. Next week, here are your new targets. Oh, you changed your goal? Okay, we'll give you new targets. Very objective, very neutral. And what it does is it calculates your expenditure. Go back and listen to episode 98, episode 98, if you want to learn all about food loggers. But definitely go get Macrofactor. Use my code, wits and weights, all in word, wits and weights, to get an extra free week on your trial. And reach out to me for help if you need help setting it up. Definitely have to log your food for one minimum reason alone, and that is awareness. When you're in a fat loss phase, if you don't know what's going in your mouth from a calorie and a macro perspective, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to go back to yo-yo land 
and you're going to be over consuming on the weekend or you're going to be grazing and not realizing you're going to be snacking you're going to have alcohol and you're going to just have lots of uncertainty floating around. But if you can just track your food, you're going to have that awareness. And if you can track your food and use it for targets because the food logger knows how many calories you're burning, even better. All right. So then once you've got that set up, you're going to go at a reasonable rate of loss. Remember before I said one of the biggest mistakes is cutting too aggressively. And the most you want to cut is 1% body weight per week. But I found that most women, because of the tighter calorie budget, are better off at around half to maybe 0.75% body weight per week so that you're not restricting those calories too low and causing all the other issues we talked about. Yes, it's going to take a little longer, but wouldn't you rather it take longer, be able to get through it successfully and not have to feel like you're suffering on low, you know, lower and lower calories? Probably. Most people would take that trade off. You can shift calories around within the week to work with your lifestyle. So if you're a big weekend partier and you love to go out to eat on the weekends, shift the calories a little bit toward the weekend. Now, the more you do this, the more extreme you get with this, the less consistent your schedule is, and that actually could backfire with your metabolism. So I wouldn't do that too much. I would shift a little, you know, a few hundred calories here and there, not like a thousand calories where you save it up for the weekend. And then as you go through the dieting phase, the fat loss phase, you can use tools like refeeds and diet breaks to give you some psychological relief as needed or to fit within your lifestyle, like if you're going on a trip, right? A refeed is like a one to two day period where you eat up at your maintenance calories and take a little break. Worst case, it's just going to pause your fat loss for a few days. Um, diet breaks are just longer versions of that where you might go for a week. Like maybe you're going on a cruise, maybe you're going on a trip, you go for a week. Now, if you still log during that time, you'll at least know where you stand. If you don't, just be aware of all the other things of selecting protein, eating the right amount of carbs, eating nutrient density, and like stick close to that <laughs> when you're on your cruise so that it doesn't completely backfire your progress, but it is still just one week. And so we've got to enjoy life, right? It's fine. Sometimes you just need the break and that's fine too. So whatever works for you. Last thing is, if you want to get the best results possible, having accountability from another person or community is going to make a huge difference. It just is. Every time I look in my life where I, you know, wanted to go after a goal and I floundered around and I experimented and I tried to do it myself, you know, DIY and I read podcasts and read books. It was just fits and starts and fits and starts and sometimes going down the wrong path, but then kind of recorrecting and back and forth. And then I'd hire a coach and it was like, boom, one month done or whatever, whatever you're trying to achieve, you know, you would, you would do it, you kind of take a shortcut, right? To that direct path. So a free way to do this, right? If a coaching is too expensive is to join our Wits and Weights Facebook community. In there, you have the opportunity to ask me questions that I will answer live. You have the opportunity to ask a whole bunch of smart people in the group questions about your training, your nutrition, recipe ideas, just to share your wins, share your frustrations, talk to people, you know, have that support of people who are positive. By the way, our community is positive and not in a delusional way, in a genuine, we all want to help, we've all been there kind of way. There is no room for people who try to bring others down, people who are toxic. I've only had to kick out like two people from the group the whole time it's been open. So we invite positive people and generally have positive people. You can gain a lot from that. The Wits and Weights Facebook community. Link is always in the show notes. And then the other way to get accountability is working with a nutrition coach. Uh, I am a nutrition coach, but there are many others out there. There's lots of different levels of service people provide. And, you know, you've got to find what's right for you. If you like what you hear on my show, if I sound like a decent enough guy that you could stand listening to giving you feedback on a weekly basis so that we get you that result, uh, please reach out. And if not, you know, maybe I can refer you to somebody else uh, or at least join into the community and say hello. All right. So accountability is the last piece. That's quite a list. I hope it wasn't overwhelming. And again, there is this free guide that will go through it all again for you. Hopefully it is clear, it is crystal clear that losing body fat requires some strategy. <laughs> it requires some thinking ahead, some patience, and some special considerations, especially for women. We want to support your body's needs, your hormones. We want to have realistic expectations. We want to adhere to an appropriate for you nutrition and training plan so you get there the right way 
and avoid all these other mistakes that so many women make. So if you are ready to chat about your specific situation and how to go through a proper body recomp prep phase, you know, the primer or the prep phase we talked about, if you want to avoid the negative effects of low energy restriction, if you want to train properly for your body to improve your health, your physique, your hormones, and execute a successful fat loss phase, and if you want to lose somewhere like 20 to 30 pounds of fat the right way, just reach out to me and set up a free results breakthrough session, totally free. Every week I clear spots in my calendar to chat with women about their nutrition and training strategy. And what we're going to do is just map out, here are the top two or three steps to take right now to get unstuck and make real progress. And that's it. No selling, no pitching, none of that. Simply a strategy that we work out together. Click the link in my show notes for the free call. Let's make it happen. Okay. In our next episode, 128, my favorite gym things, seven gifts under $100. I've put together a fun but highly useful list of equipment and accessories that I recommend for your home gym or gym bag just in time for the holidays or maybe your birthday or just a gift to yourself to celebrate a recent win. Make sure to subscribe to the show. Please subscribe. It's one of the best th ways that you can support me is just tap the little toggle in your podcast app right now that says follow or subscribe so you get new episodes and you'll get all these new episodes as soon as they drop. If you don't want to listen to them, you just delete it. But please subscribe and you'll get notified. And I really thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting this show and for listening. And I always welcome your feedback. As always, stay strong. And I'll talk to you next time here on the Wits and Weights podcast. <laughs>